So our final speaker today for this session and for the, uh, for the day is um, Molly Bassett. And she could not be here today. So she will be communicating with us via Skype. And um, what we're going to do is um, uh, show a videotape that will give you her presentation and her images. And um, she will stay on screen at the end. And she will, we think, be able to participate in the discussion and answer questions. We'll see. Um, a little bit about her for those of you who don't know Molly. Um, she's currently uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Georgia State University. Um, sh her book, the title of which is The Fate of Earthly Things, Aztec Deities and Their Embodiments, has just been released by the University of Texas Press. She has a number of articles to her credit. She focuses um, um, on Nahua deities, uh, Nahua concepts of the human body. Uh, she's been paying a special attention to wrappings, as you'll hear shortly, uh, which includes skin. Um, and today, she's going to talk about uh, what we call sacred bundles, which is a topic that Guillaume has also written about. Uh, she's written and spoken uh, on that uh, extensively. So the title of Molly's talk today is The Bundles of Earthly Things. And here we go. Do I do anything now? <laughs> I'm getting up. Nursing manuscripts, including classical and medieval encyclopedias, herbaria, and dictionaries, had an undeniable influence on the form, contents, and overall conception of Bernardino de Sahagún's Florentine Codex. Given their influence, how might we determine what elements of the Aztec cosmovision, that is, indigenous understandings of the physical and metaphysical worlds and their interconnections, are present in earthly things? Recent research, including some by scholars here today, supports the position that details related to how 16th century Nahuatl speakers perceived and conceived of their world lie in the languages, illustrations, organization, and material composition of earthly things. The texts and illustrations in the Florentine Codex are, to borrow language from performance studies scholar Diana Taylor, the archives for early modern for early modern repertoires that include vestiges of Aztec, European, and emerging ways of understanding the living world. Distinct elements of the Aztec cosmovision appear in the books, text, and images. To give just one example, Sahagun's informants and scribes elaborate on three types of turquoise, shiwi, ordinary turquoise, Teoshimi, an exquisite godlike turquoise, and Tlapal Teoshimi, an exceptional colored turquoise. Each differently named turquoise is accompanied by a description that explains its qualities. While ordinary turquoise was not so remarkable, the other two types were exceptional to the point of being godlike. The distinctions among these three types appear in the Nahuatl text and arise from Nahuatl evaluations of blue, green, and precious stones. Even though the illustrations of these turquoises bear striking resemblance to those of stones found in the Horta Sanitatis, the text conveys an indigenous perspective on their varying values and uses. Aztecs recognized three different qualities of turquoise, and they distinguished among the kinds with reference to the supernatural. But what's the significance of these descriptions and their comparison in the context of the Florentine Codex's natural history? <coughs> One of the challenges Mesoamericanists have faced for a long time has been how to organize information like this. Guillaume Olivier made a similar point a few minutes ago when he noted that European models of polytheistic pantheons influenced the gods' organization in the Florentine Codex and have largely been unquestioned by scholars. He also mentioned some indigenous methods of deity organization, the lords of the, light, of the night, the lords of the day, the patrons of calendric periods, etc. The theory I'm testing today is that it might be similarly advantageous to use indigenous modes of organization to sort conceptually related objects and entities into groupings. 
using indigenous modes of classification to sort objects and entities described in Book 11, Earthly Things, may help us identify repertoires, that is, cognitive frames for understanding the living world from within the archives of its pages. In this paper, I'm tentatively proposing a single indigenous organizational model, the Kamili or bundle, as a place to begin exploring how Nawas might have classified their living world. My process has two steps. First, I want to examine the usefulness of the bundle as an organizational metaphor and a physical model of the cosmovision. Second, I'm interested in how reading earthly things using the lens of folk biology, the study of how peoples order their local living world, might call our attention to bundled objects and entities. After explaining how Camille bundle functioned as a linguistic quantifier and an ontological qualifier, I will tentatively identify two folk biology bundles, one that contains meteorological entities and another ordered by ocelots. In conclusion, I'll return to my primary question. Given the Florentine Codex's foreign influences, how can we identify conceptually related things that bridge the divide between the natural and the supernatural and examine how they function together in Aztec cosmology and world construction? In their introduction to folk biology, Douglas L. Nedden and Scott Atron take the position that people's actions on the natural world are surely conditioned in part by their ways of knowing and modeling it. In the case of the Aztecs, language, image, and matter converged in ritual and other religious activities that recognized and produced animate entities and sacred structures in the natural environment and human-made world. But differently, Aztecs admitted no ontological distinction between human and non-human creation. Nature was ritualized just as ritual was naturalized. Furthermore, Aztecs identified specific equivalences among significant objects, entities, and structures. The Xipla is the most astounding equivalence in the Aztec cosmovision, but other examples, and some of them quite curious, abound. For instance, the heart-shaped fruit from the Nogal cactus also served in sacrifice, not because it stood for or replaced the human heart, but because it was equivalent, one more manifestation of nourishing food. As this example illustrates, Aztec's understanding of their local environment operated according to cognitive models, assumptions about animacy and modes of engagement that did not and still do not align with Western expectations of flora, fauna, and landscape. Ethnographers and ethnolinguists have shown that people living in indigenous cultures develop complex systems of naming and categorizing entities and objects in their local environment. We know that Aztecs have complicated systems for quantifying and classifying people and stuff around them. From social stratification to marketplace negotiations to gendering newborns, Aztecs recognized difference and noted it in daily life. <coughs> Earthly things and early post-contact herbaria, like the Badianas manuscript, demonstrate that Aztecs also engaged in folk biology. They had an everyday knowledge of the biological world. Folk biology is the non-Western, that is non-Linnaean, life science practiced in indigenous cultures and it reflects rich, direct, and indirect experience with biological kinds. A given folk biology's taxonomies depend on the culture's local environment and the people's life world, their perception of that environment. Different folk biologies recognize and prioritize various characteristics of flora, fauna, and landscape based on a number of factors. For instance, people who live in heavily forested jungles may recognize birds by their songs rather than their appearances, because the density of jungle plant life prevents them from seeing birds closely or often. These are culturally constructed relationships. Folk biology is not an unmediated observation of nature. The text and images of the Florentine Codex demonstrate that the Aztecs had direct and undeniably rich experience of their local and regional environments, and earthly things contains abundant information about their folk biology. Like the physical bundles Aztecs used to contain cloths or embody deities, conceptual chameleon, folk biology bundles, if you will, 
bring together features of the lo features of the local and human-made environments that work complementarily and collaboratively. In the next few minutes, I'll explain why I think the Camille is a useful addition to existing conceptions of the Aztec cosmovision. I will illustrate how a Camille or bundle might function as an organizing principle in cognitive undertakings like folk biology. And I'll discuss two examples, a meteorological bundle and an ocelot bundle. I'm just beginning this research and I'm particularly excited to hear your feedback today. <coughs> The Camille and the related Tlacumi Loli, or sacred bundle, are two of several ways in which Aztecs quantified, and in the case of Tlacumi Loli, qualified things. Speakers of older Nahuatl routinely used what linguists call classifiers or quantifiers. A quantifier is a word that indicates the semantic class to which a noun belongs. Nahuatl's reliance on quantifiers stems from its restrained use of the plural. Daniel Deu identifies Camille as one of four base classifiers, which she distinguishes from form classifiers. Base classifiers quantify groups of 20 beings or things, and common base classifiers included Tecpantli, Ipili, Camille, and Tlamic. Kimili, bundle of cloths or blankets, is the nominalized form of kimiloa, to wrap someone or something in a blanket, to enshroud. Kimili referred to a wrapped package of 20 capes, cloths, or blankets. De Hoove underscores the significance of the bundle's physical form, its shape. It must be understood that capes were tied in bundles and not, as in the case of Ipili, a quantifier of flat objects, placed one over the other in layers. The significance of Kimili in Aztec culture extends far beyond its ability to count and quantify. To the Aztecs, bundles represented complete things. The process of wrapping bound things together and into a whole, like wrapping a broken bone, facilitates healing. Kimili and Kimiloa occur in contexts where curing and healing took place through wrapping, and where binding completed temporary ceremonial structures. In the Aztec digestional system of counting, one based on 20, a bundle was more than just a bunch of cloth. It was a physical presentation of fullness and completeness. In addition to ordinary bundles of things, Aztecs recognized a special category of bundle, the Tlacmi Loli, or sacred bundle. From cloth exteriors to ash, bone, and chalchiwit heart interiors, the composite materials of Tlacuni Loli both constituted the, the god body and made it recognizable, regardless of the fact that Tlacuni Loli were neither anthropomorphic nor zoomorphic, devotees identified the gods they embodied by virtue of a bundle's recollection of a god's constitutive qualities. Before I move on in my argument, let me briefly introduce one specific Tlacuni Loli, that of Tezcalipoca, mirror smoking. This is a familiar image of Tezcalipoca. Here he stands in the center of the frontispiece of the Codex Fejervari Mayor. Sacred bundles contain deity relics, and according to one close contact source, Tezcalipoca's Tlacuni Loli contained a polished mirror, the size and measure of half a large orange set in a crude black stone. With it were many loose fine stones, including green stones, emeralds, turquoises, and many others. And the cloth that was closest to the mirror and stones, it was painted with a human skeleton. Bartolome de las Casas, a second source, indicates that uh, that Tezcalipoca left his devotees el hueso de su muslo, the bone of his thigh, and a mirror. I could go into more detail here, but for our purposes, it's enough to note that people thought of Tezcalipoca's bundle as containing a mirror and possibly a thigh bone. The idea that this god's Tlacuni Loli contained a mirror comes as no surprise, given his onomastic, corporeal, and mythohistorical associations with smoking mirrors in particular and obsidian more generally. Tezcalipoca's name means smoking mirror, his lower leg or foot is a smoking mirror, and his Tlacuni Loli contained a smoking mirror bound with a leg bone. Tezcatlipoca both is and is lord of the smoking mirror, 
and is identified by the visual or material smoking mirror. This makes it difficult for us to distinguish the eponym from its embodied apotheosis. It also calls attention to the closeness Nawa's experience in language, representation, and materiality. The thing, its name, and its depiction lack significant distinction, or conversely, they overlap significantly. The bundle was the god, the reassembled god body, and an image of the god, none apart from the other. The chameleon flakini loli literally and physically bound things together. This afternoon, I'm extending the act of bundling and the physical bundle into metaphor as a way to identify equivalences, relationships, and difference. In early post-contact conversations about what things were, Nawas and Spaniards used speech and images to identify places, things, and beings in their shared world. We find Nawas calling more than one cat ocelot, and Spaniards calling cats that weren't tigers tigre. Jaguars as we know them today are neither ocelots nor tigers. In the midst of this confusion, how are we to sort out who meant what and which things were like others? As I indicated a few minutes ago, I'll be using the ocelot to explore the utility of the chameleon as a classifier. First, I want to provide one example of what I see as the bundle's potential capacity to help us see how Nawa's organized not just bunches of fabric, but the fabric of their worldview. Decades ago, Eduardo Matos Moctezuma pointed out that the right side of the Templo Mayor recreates Coatepec. The Templo Mayor symbolism, the serpent statues, and the recovery of multiple coil shalky stones indicates that the Aztecs recreated the site of their patron god's birth in the heart of their ceremonial center. In the myth of Huitzilopochtli's birth, Huatlique became pregnant while sweeping the temple or Coatepec and the Templo Mayor, or Coatepec, set a ritual stage for the Aztec state's reenactment of Huitzilopochtli's triumph over formerly powerful polities. The idea that a temple could be a mountain and that a mountain could be a temple is well established. Additionally, I'm proposing that mountains and temples were bundles. Mountains, temples, and bundles share functional and structural similarities that I'll describe and also demonstrate. First, Tlacani Loli, temples or Teocali, and mountains were god bodies or god houses by virtue of the fact that they contained Teot stuff, god stuff. Each of these three structures, temples, mountains, and Tlacani Loli, contained gods to Teo. As we've already seen, Tlacani Loli embodied gods by recollecting a deity's bioarchaeological remains, as Calipocus femur, his possessions, the mirror, and his clothes, the animal hide and cloth wrappings. Temples protected Tlacani Loli and housed other forms of deity embodiments. An incredible number and variety of god bodies resided in the many Teokali of the Aztec Empire. In addition to the god bodies recovered at major sites, the Xicla litter the Mexican landscape, as well as the pages of the Florentine Codex and other early post-contact sources. Both Tlacani Loli and Teocali contained gods. Tlacani Loli embodied gods, and Teocali protected living god bodies. What then about mountains? A compound word formed of at, water, and tepet, mountain. Altepet means village or community. In pre-contact cultures, Altepeme were political and cultural units. Contemporary Nahua towns in Mexico are Altepeme, and each has its own tepet, mountain. People identify with their Altepet, and they identify it with local deities. In the community where I've worked, the Altepet is home to the Chikomisochi, the holy family seen here. The community treats these paper god embodiments as living beings. And although the gods reside in a family's home for a year, they also live in and on the community mountain. Like the gods, the mountain is a living, breathing being. Nawas in the same community described the echoing thunder of storms as the chatter of mountain deities. Aztecs and their contemporaries perceived mountains' animacy too. Mountains and volcanoes were active features of the imperial landscape. Aztecs delivered water from the springs of Chapultepec Hill, they watched water vapor rise from smoking mountains that surrounded them, and they compared fog rising from caves to mountains' respiration. 
Myths recorded in the 16th century tell us the mountains contained water or corn, the sustaining elements of life. In his recent essay, Configuration of the Sacred Precinct of Mexico, Tenochtitlan, Eduardo Matos Montezuma emphasized the importance of recognizing that Tlaloc's side of the Templo Mayor is the mountain of sustenance, or Tonacatepe, also mentioned in myth. In particular, the one in which Quetzalcoatl must enter the mountain to steal the corn stored there to be given to men. Mountains are temples or bundles insofar as each contains vital sustenance, water, corn, life, and gods. Mountains are temples or bundles because they share a common structure, too. To demonstrate this point, let's return to the image of Tezcalipoca from the Prentice piece. We frequently read this image as a bird's eye view of Tezcalipoca atop the temple. There in the center, he performs auto sacrifice with a calendar, cardinal directions, and other deities surrounding him. So somewhere near you, I hope that you can find a paper handout that is a copy of this same image. Um, if you take your paper handout, uh, fold the model, so fold the flat piece of paper, so that Tezcalipoca is standing atop the temple. So fold the trapezoidal, the four sides down, and the four corners that end in birds up. So here we have Tezcalipoca standing atop a temple. Now if you'll flatten the image out again, fold all eight sides up and over so that they enclose Tezcalipoca. And now he's in the center of a Tlacini Loli. When we physically manipulate these images, Tezcalipoca stands on the summit of a mountain temple and then he is wrapped inside a sacred bundle. This mountain is a temple is a bundle, and from any of these vantage points, on the mountain, on the temple, or within the bundle, Tezcalipoca is and is in the center of the cosmovision. From either location, from any of these locations, he can, be, he can see the entire vision, and he is also an integral member of it. We could perform a similar exercise with the Templo Mayor another temple mountain that's a bundle. Instead of inverting it by folding the sides up and around, let's invert the entire structure. As the layers of new temples enclose older ones, they wrap, bind, and enshroud the earlier temple structures in newer outer structures. In between the layers, priests and rulers bury offering caches and standard bearers. Given its enshrouding structure and multiple mountain significations, the Temple Mayor may just be the ultimate mountain temple bundle in the Aztec world. I'm arguing that mountains, temples, and bundles are structural and functional homologues because I would like to extend our understanding of a bundle beyond that of just a quantifier. Speakers of older Nahuatl use the bundle as a quantifier, but they recognize its qualitative significance as well. Some Kinili were Tlacini Loli, and these sacred bundles had the potential to resurrect gods by binding divine biographies to material culture. Additionally, bundles could be physically and metaphorically seen in other structures of the Aztec cosmovision. That a mountain was a temple was a bundle also demonstrates that elements of the natural, supernatural, and built environments were not confined to bounded or discrete lives in those worlds products of these worlds transmitted among them. So let's experiment with the ocelot bundle. The chameleon was a quantifier, and it was also a container and a structurally significant model and metaphor in Aztec culture. In considering how to explore elements of Nahuatl folk biology embedded in the European-influenced earthly things, I decided to start with the ocelot, the first entry in Book 11. Even though European manuscripts influenced the order in which Sahagun and his colleagues listed items, the ocelot held an indisputable place of importance in Aztec culture, as it had throughout Mesoamerica. <laughs> Earthly things includes four Nahuatl entries for ocelot. Ocelot, Iztac ocelot, or white ocelot, Tlatlapi ocelot, or ruddy ocelot, and Tlaco ocelot, or Tlacoitzli. The lengthy description in Earthly Things emphasizes the animal's length, musculature, feet, ears, face, eyes, nose, teeth, and claws. 
Following the listing of its physical features, the scribes turn toward the ocelot's coloring, one of the animal's essential characteristics. It is varicolored, quite varicolored, spotted with black, blotched with black, white-chested, smooth, sleek. Like ocelots, it becomes varicolored. It is variously colored, variously marked, it becomes varicolored. It is variously colored like an ocelot. Claws emerge, they grasp, they clutch, Teeth, molars, canines emerge. It bares its teeth, gnaws, bites, tears. It growls, snarls, howls, roars like the blowing of trumpets. The second sentence in this excerpt underscores the significance of the ocelot's coloring. Quiquilti, defined by Francis Cartonin as something painted, also carries the connotation of being multicolored. Listen to its repetition. Ocelotti, quiquilti. Mokupiloa, Kukwilti, Kukwiltia, Moselo Kukwiloa. The writer began and ended this sentence with ocelot, and in between he named the cat's multicolor coat five times. Earthly Things provides a detailed description of the ocelot, one among four types of this animal, and in addition to emphasizing the animal's ferocious features, its claws, teeth, and trumpeting roar. The text underscores the importance of its colored coat. The animal's physicality was key to its identification and to its appearance elsewhere. We find ocelot embedded in the names of animals and plants that were also very colored. But what was this animal called ocelot? How have we gone about identifying the Nahuatl ocelot with animals known in the Linnaean taxonomic system? Often identified as Panthera anca or jaguar, the older Nahuatl word ocelot referred to more than one creature. Ocelot signified both the jaguar and the animal we know as the ocelot, Felis pardalis, a smaller and similarly marked cat. As Leon Garcia Garza confirmed to me, the Nahuatl taxonomy was not as linear as ours. Both the small ocelot and the larger jaguar would have been called ocelot in antiquity. They are both felines, morphologically related carnivorous and hence dangerous man-eaters, tequanine, spotted felines essentially. Note that the animals are called by the same name because they look alike and act alike from a Nawa perspective. That is, from the perspective of someone about to be eaten. <laughs> perspective is key in understanding Nawa folk biology. Why do we associate ocelot with a jaguar and a smaller ocelot? I think there are several reasons, but a primary one is that major editions of the Florentine Codex translate it this way. Even though Anderson and Dibble cite sources for their identification of, ind of indigenous mammals with Linnaean types, we should keep in mind that speakers of older Nahuatl did not recognize animals as mammals. Spaniards introduced this word and concept. By contrast to Europeans, Nahuas did not interact with many domesticated animals, let alone mammals. There were no cows, no horses, no goats, and no sheep in the Americas. Dairy was not an important dietary component, and Aztecs weaned babies straight to semi-solid foods. What seems like a common sense category, mammals, those animals that give birth to live young and nurse them, did not exist in older Nawa, at least in part because it was not important from a Nawa perspective. To native speakers of older Nawa and to modern Nawas, wild animals were tequanine, people eaters, a name that describes one crucial relationship Nawas had to these animals. The physical description of ocelot given in earthly things notes this relationship, hunter to hunted hunter and the importance of ocelot's abilities, in particular the fear its hunting prowess inspired, carried prestige in military and, devotion, and divinatory circles. Between descriptions of the third and fourth types of ocelot appear a lengthy account of humans hunting and being hunted by the cats, and an aside devoted to the ocelot and divination. In their account of hunting ocelots, the scribes explain the hunter's approach to the cats. And the hunters have their reckoning, as well as their custom, that they shoot only four times. If he shoots four arrows, the hunter is as good as dead. Thereupon the ocelot prepares itself, it stretches, it yawns, it stirs, it shakes itself, it cleans itself, it licks itself. 
Then indeed it crouches, springs, flies through the air. Whether the hunter stands 10 spans, even 15 spans away, there it goes to seize him. Only once does it leap, fly, squish, bristling its hair ruffled. There dies the hunter, there he is eaten. This passage portrays the ocelot as a confident hunter practically bored by the task before him. This people either yawns, licks his paws, and pounces. These were characteristics the ocelot imparted to Aztec warriors. The ocelot figured prominently in the language and imagery of, the Aztec, of Aztec military and its ritual culture, including its procural of sacrificial victims. One of the Aztecs' most prestigious military schools, the Order of the Ocelot, took its name from these animals. Aztecs associated the Ocelot day sign with bravery and fierceness, and according to its use in the Florentine Codex, the word denoted, or connoted rather, nobility, humili humility, dexterity, command, and glory. Returning to the text, Sahagun's scribes went on to explain that skilled hunters have ways to distract the ocelot, but they did not end the description of the hunt with the human hunter. Instead, they reiterated the fright these cats inspired. Wherever the ocelot eats, first it hisses at one in order to terrify one, to make him swoon away. In conclusion, the scribes added a note about the ocelot's relationship to diviners. The conjurers went about carrying its hide, the hide of its forehead and of its chest and its tail, its nose, its claws, and its heart, and its fangs and its snout. It is said that they went about their tasks with them, that they did daring deeds because of them they were feared, that with them they were daring. Given the relative importance of surfaces and appearances in Aztec understandings of persons and personhood, the ocelot's physical appearance, along with its with the use of its skin and divination, and the construction of sacred bundles provides some initial material for an ocelot bundle. On one hand, Nawa's physically bundled precious goods in flak lily wrapped with ocelot skins. The physical sacred bundle invites us to consider the full biological bundle, the contents and associations of which would depend upon context. A diviner may have associated an ocelot bundle with characteristics rele uh, relevant to her practice, other creatures that see well at night, or with other talismans that inspire fear. For hunters, an ocelot bundle could have bound together the bones or skins of other tequanime, or they may have included artifacts that functioned as tactics for killing fierce beasts. At this point, my question is whether it's possible and if so useful to reconstruct an ocelot bundle. Such a reconstruction could follow the model of the meteorological bundle that included mountain, temple, community, cave, rain, etc. The meteorological bundle presents a neat package, forgive the pun. Mesoamericanists have long recognized temples and mountains as cognates. The inclusion of community fits structurally, functionally, and cosmologically. If an ocelot bundle seems useful, what else belongs in the bundle? Or should ocelot be part of a more encompassing bundle? With these questions, we've reached the leading edge of this aspect of my project. These questions and observations bring me to a few tentative conclusions, and I'll be pursuing some of these as I continue this research. First, there are physical and folk biology versions of the ocelot bundle to consider. With regard to the physical chameli, ocelot cloaks would have been bundled in chameli and the skins used to wrap some flakini loli. Perhaps they were included inside some sacred bundles too. So then where did ocelot skins appear in bundles? What was their significance in various bundles? Who produced, received, and cared for these bundles? What meaning did the ocelot skin import to them? What were the other contents of the bundles? Ocelot skins are relevant to folk biology bundles, too. These bundles collect associated concepts, like those related to the ocelot day sign or those connected to ocelots through their characteristic connotations, such as nobility, bravery, or humility. If the physical bundles bound together animal hides or god bodies, what do the folk biology bundles collect or recollect? Additionally, what homologies, like those among mountain, temple, and flakini loli, 
might we find in ocelot bundles? Finally, what do these bundles, whose contents easily transmit from the natural world to the supernatural world, tell us about how Nawas perceived, imagined, and creatively reconstructed their local environment and cosmovision? So we're calling her. <laughs> um, this little camera, it encompasses pretty much the whole room. So if you stand up and ask a question, she will presumably see and hear you. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. Come on up. Lisa? She can. can you see us, Molly? Molly, can you see the whole room? I can see everyone, yes. Do you want to stay there? Though? What do you think? I think you can go up, but that way we can see you. They want to see you, so come on up. So the panel is going to sit in front of you, Molly. Okay. Um, they have their backs to you, actually. I'm sorry. Um, well, we just listened to your very wonderful uh, presentation with lots of ideas and things for people to think about, and it's time now to open up the discussion to the, um, the audience, and uh, Lisa and, and Guillaume also might be the recipients of questions. So um, does, who, does can, can you turn the lights on somewhere back there? Great. Um, well, maybe that's not such a great idea. That fades her out. Can you turn them back down? <laughs> Um, so, uh, who has the first question and for whom? Yes, Elizabeth. Oh, I have a question for Lisa. Um, I'll just yell. Um, how do you reconcile your flowery words with our traditional knowledge of flowery speech? You alluded to it, but how do we hold these? I thought mm -hmm. you talked was fabulous. But how do we hold these in balance? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think one thing that's really interesting is that although the the Nawa authors seem to be condemning the procurus especially, there's also a bit of an admiration. I mean, she's described as a master of discourse. So I think in many in many parts of Nawa cosmology, like with, with, with the deities, right? They can have positive attributes and negative attributes. And, and the main thing is that language is powerful. And it, it can be used for good, but it can be also used to lead people astray. Thank you. OK, uh, Leon, you had a I have one question for Molly and one for uh, Ian. Yeah, anybody think anything they thought? Yeah, we Just one question about the Ocelot bundle. Uh, where did you get the information and what, uh, what else do we know about uh, the context of this Ocelot bundle? Very fascinating. Yeah, so something that I found difficult to communicate in a paper, and especially not being there in person, is that um, what, I'm, what I'm testing out is uh, applying this idea of the, the bundle as quantifier and qualifier to the folk biology that is in Book 11. So there, to my knowledge, there's no ocelot bundle, but there might have been. Or the bundle might be a good way for us to think about how information uh, could be collected together. Uh, so I think that um, tomorrow we will hear Elizabeth talk some about the deity images. And one of the things that I think she'll talk about is the way they've been decontextualized. But I think that there was stuff bundled around them, that they were surrounded by the things that they um, needed uh, to, to perform ceremonies or needed to be effective gods. And we don't know what that stuff is, but that was in the bundle. Um, and I think the bundle might be a good model for other ways, or for, for um, it might be a good way to think about how concepts were collected in other uh, realms, too. Okay, so more of a metaphor than anything else. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I 
hear me? No, sorry. It's all right. Thank you very much. I have a question for uh, Guillermo. I, I wanted to uh, ask you something about uh, the model of, of, of or the equivalent between Berkeley and uh, Bell. Talk louder. And it's more like a comment because uh, precisely with Molly, I was in that community in the Peshitla, right, Molly? Yes. And, uh, and people from there, when uh, in those ceremonies for Chico uh, Mesochi and the, uh, the deity of the mountain, who's clearly recognizable as Tlaloc, uh, the ceremony is called Feeding the Waters. Disney, uh, with many references to ancient ceremonies that we find in Waito <coughs> for instance, right? And uh, the people there, when I say, well, is this the God of the mountain? And they say, well, we don't say God. We say, Itekotepe, he is the owner of the mountain. It's a dueño de la ventana. So it's like, and then I realized that the, 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 this uh, semantic association we have between the word Lord, Señor, and we do not realize that it's truly a, 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 an ownership presence of power in the physical realm. So there's actually no distinction between supernatural and supernatural. They're just one and the same. It's just a manifestation of the real ownership of power. That's what I wanted to say. Not my two cents, but their two cents. <laughs> it's the owner. Thank you. Somebody else had their hand up. Who was that? I, I wanted to just say something about Molly's uh, presentation. There is a, a data in, in the work of Ixtel Soshik saying that uh, uh, Quetzalcoatl ashes were uh, uh, conserved in a, in a bundle made of uh, the skin of a jaguar. Mm -hmm. And also I wanted to uh, to cite uh, a work from Pablo Escalante, who recognized um, a possible bundle made of the skin of a jaguar in the painting of the convent of Quoting Chan. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's a pillow of the Virgin, right? <laughs> Thank you. You had to hit up, Jeanette. So, Amali, um, what is to prevent us from, are you simply transferring the notion of bundle uh, as another word for container or category? Or is there something, are you going, you're going beyond the conceptual into the material. So it's, it's not just a metaphor, it's metonymic. Yes, it's, I think it's all, all of that. Are you finished? I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, go ahead. Um, so there were physical bundles, and I suspected that there were bundles with ocelot or jaguar skin. So I'm glad William has, has confirmed that. Um, so the bundles were physical things. They were living deities. They were also... Uh, containers like ordinary bundles of cloths existed and I think that the way all of those physical things work suggests that there was a, a conceptual level that the bundle functioned in, in the Nahuatl mind. So that the bundle was a thing for them in the way, the way that we would say maybe a school of fish, but much more important than that. Um, so, so the way the quantifier worked linguistically, there was also a thing that worked that way. But what I'm hoping is that the, the idea of the bundle um, will collect, would also collect information in, in folk biology, so separate from uh, the religious realm, maybe, but that those folk biological bundles straddle the divide that Leon has just said do doesn't really exist in modern Nawa communities. So there's no reason for us to look at deities apart from animals or plants that the way we divide the natural world, they didn't and don't. So we need, we need ways of conceiving of things going together differently than our Linnaean taxonomy works for us. So is it related to units of 20? I, I mean, how are you going to take, it was convenient for you to use the ocelot, but what about trees and fish and other <coughs> categories? Are they similarly going to have a skin or a cloth covering? Or is that when you move into a more abstract or conceptual model? 
Um, so that's a great question. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> um, the, the other places I've tested this out are, I've been looking at maze. And so to think about what bundles around maze as important, you know, what are the important connections maze had to other kinds of materials or foodstuffs or concepts. Um, so I think that that might be a, a potent place to look at this, but I don't know that it would work just to sort of open book 11 and pick a plant and say what was the bundle, but it could and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know yet. <clears throat> Can you speak a little louder? Yes. <laughs> I like very much your paper. It's like putting a book in 30 minutes. It's incredible how many things on topic and subject you could put together. Thank you. Uh, it was very, very interesting and very intelligent. I see that it's a family thing. Um, <laughs> but what I'm trying to mention is that perhaps it's useful to remember how important the linguistic purpose of Sagun's work is, and how he has this aim that he explicitly mentions of gathering vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Because these sections, when he characterizes the prostitute, for instance, it is so exhaustive, so it, it, it is even funny when you see how many he is giving synonyms and all, all kind of options for evil things, for and uh, I just wanted to remember that mm -hmm. it is important to recall. And, and you, you mentioned how then there's just one Spanish sentence mm -hmm. to, to, to follow that, because the work was done. The, the purpose was to bring it out, all the words that we, we could possibly be related to that and such. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's one of the things I wanted to say. And the other one is, I think we're in a very good moment now, after several studies, from the Maya area and also with Nahuatl have been done, try, trying to approach the meaning of supernatural and the ways to represent the supernatural. And I think that um, those scrolls and the scrolls with the flowers uh, clearly point to this same group of um, the, those bundle. <laughs> the, the same bundle uh, of things that are not, you cannot see them, but oh, they're so strong. Yeah. They act so strongly, they can go into yourself. And, and, and uh, of course, uh, both aroma, you see aroma? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the word, they have the same huge power, and so their semantic, uh, they share the same semantic feel. Mm -hmm. These things that they must be sacred, there's no way to see them. The things that they exist, they can come out of the flower or out of the mouth, and they go into yourself through your nose, through your ears, and they're strongly active to you. So, and I think there's most of more work we have to do with that, but we can see, sort of see now, how it is working, and of course it has to go along with the concept of offering in, in the native tradition. I think that's basically what I want. Well, thank you for, for both of those points. Um, one of the interesting things that I, I'm still thinking about is that since procurer is just literally a person, you know, it, it, there's no difference between a male procurer and a female procurer. Why have, why gender it that way? Why was there this, you know, idea that you didn't satisfy it in just one category? So that's something interesting to think about, but also, you know, why is it that when they do speak of the female <coughs> purists that the, the text is so much longer? But um, I, I agree that it's, it's interesting to consider the, the linguistic project that's behind, uh, especially, I think, Book 10. Um, the, the other issue I just wanted to, to talk about is that um, flowers do have beautiful scents, and, I, and I'm wondering if maybe some of those wispy things on the flowers might be indicating that, but also um, bad smells bring illness and disease and are associated with immorality. And um, uh, recently at an ethnic history conference, I gave a paper which described um, the illness brought about by a Spanish pig farmer who was committing adultery in the community. <laughs> so there was all kinds of, you know, mixture of um, illicit sexuality and the bad smells uh, of the Spaniards farm <laughs> that, that could be, you know, behind some of this. But I, just as a, a final point, I just think it's so interesting that 
the, the Tlaquila were still innovating um, in, in Book 10 and not just borrowing from European models, you know, or adapting them per se, but still engaged in, you know, how can we elaborate on, on some of these traditions like the speech scroll to make it a little more interesting or, or relevant to, to the text. Thank you. Barbara then Manuel. This is for Manuel. You see, uh, I, I really enjoyed all. I, I really enjoyed all the papers. And a particular question for Molly. Do you see the potential for other base classifiers um, to function this way? And I'm thinking perhaps of things that are stacked, which gives you relationships between equivalent things that establish the hierarchy. I think there may be. Um, I. I I mean, the, the bundle left out to me because it, it is a supernatural thing, it's an ordinary thing. So, I mean, it's really an all-in-one package. I'm sorry, it's also prone to fun. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is the very beginning of this project for me. I'm just a couple of months in. So, I, I think it could very well be that the other form classifiers work similarly or overlap. Um. Yes. Manuel? This is a question for Ian. Uh, we know that there was not an exact equivalent uh, for the devil no? in the Colombian world. Then the friars chose the Placatecolodu because it was an entity that was not a god and played certain kind of uh, characteristics of the devil because they didn't want to, the Indians to think that they were polytheistic also, no? so they, they chose a non-god for that image. But you presented um, a quotation, the text there, in which it says that the true devil is the Tzitzimtu. Uh, so the, the devil is associated with Tzitzimtu in that text. Can, what is your take, or can you explain it for that text? Uh, what it was your oh. oh, sorry. <laughs> Manuel, make sure that mic is on. You have to push the button at the other end. Yes. It is on. OK. Probably need to speak now. Could I defer to Cecilia, who's written a wonderful paper on the changing ideas of the TV? I mean, I, you know, I think, I think it's like a lot of these terms in the 16th century and these concepts that are, are you know, are, are indigenous. They, in the hands of fires become changed over time. And there there are quite a few colonial texts that refer to the devil of Tzitzimi or the devil of Takatikolo. And yeah, and the Kolomekli. Well, you, you, are you talking about the devil in the skirt? Yeah. Yeah, um, that, that article starts out with um, making the point, which is still valid, that the earliest sources that we have that talk about the Tzitzimime actually describe them as women. They're fleshless women. And then as you move into the colonial period, um, you see them become, then they're a mixed group, male and female. And then eventually they're all men. And then suddenly there's Huitzilopochtli. I mean, they, they just, over a period of time, they include the ones that they want, and they exclude the ones that aren't serving their purpose. And it's, uh, it's a good argument in support of the idea that it's important to arrange things chronologically because you see then, you see the process at work as, as best we can under the circumstances. Um, yeah. Um, I know. Stephanie? Yeah. Um, I think this is for Molly, but really, again, for anyone in the room who can give me a little insight. I've been looking at the concept of the shikipili, the shikipili, which is both a, uh, a numerical, uh, you know, explanation, eight thousand, but also a sacred bag, a container, if you will, that you know some will say had was a container for incense, and then uh, perhaps later, I'm not sure the, the chronology, but also a container for cacao. Um, and so, and when you see it visually represented, it's very elaborate. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm just really fascinated with the, <clears throat> how it can serve as both a number and a container 
and also, you know, what role it might have had over time in ritual, and, and if it shifted to a more a container for more a numeric, you know, um, money, <laughs> basically, how means. So it becomes more of economic significance. Anyway, just I don't know if you thought about it yet, but it's it's one of those, you know, base quantifiers that also has all these other complex dimensions. So throw it out there for anyone. Oh. Come on, Molly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Deanna, are we going to answer that? Oh, oh, so nobody has an answer for you. <laughs> and then, um, I'll, well, I'll let Deanna go first, and then, okay. No, oh, okay. No, just for the, the, the image of the mantle that you use and the example of the 20 mantles in a bundle, I mean, that is a tribute um, concept. Right, so, so 20 as a number is a tribute number, and then it's a literal, you know, uh, what is owed and, and counted in that way, which is kind of a um, very practical use of the, of the count of the, of the bubble. Um, and I, I would just, again, in my Andean mode, um, say that there are some interesting uh, analogies in the Andes, especially in the highlands, where uh, ritual bundles are still very much part of communities. They're kept, they're filled with the instruments and the stones and the coca leaves and things which are uh, part of ritual ceremonies. And they are also um, uh, heritage bundles which are passed down through families, literally of cloth. And one of the things that's interesting is also what type of cloth is used for these bundles depending on its functions. In the Andes, the same mantle that's used to carry potatoes might then become a sacred surface and hold, you know, be the surface upon which rituals are enacted and then the materials are kept. So there's a sort of life of the, um, of the skin. Mm -hmm. so to uh, let's let uh, Diana go. And then, did you have your hand up? I just wanted to thank you both for your papers. They were amazing. And just, um, it's a, it's, it, it just, I'm just thinking still about them because they bring so many questions and observations about it. But in a sense, all this ambiguity and all, all the things we cannot really truly define as um, it seems to me that this is exactly what images are about. It's, they are complex texts that reveal and at the same time um, cover. No? They, they reveal and conceal. And what was, I was really amazed with. Um, Gillian's paper, this, because everything we were discussing before about the concept of Theobu, it was already written there. It is, it is so clearly stated that Theobu, it's really something that amazes you, that it's like incredible, big, that it, even it, like the smell of flowers or, or this god or, or the water of the ocean, or, all of this is Theobu, and nonetheless, I mean, it is written there. You brought it. You brought it there for us so clearly. Nonetheless, for many years, even today, we had been clinging to yep. our Western conceptions mm -hmm. and not being able to really, you know, read the text or see the images. So I am just also uh, like very grateful for for the experience of being here and just on. Cover and unveil one more time, please. But <laughs> my point is that the the Nawa world, the, the world of these people, it's it's really very far from what we try to classify. I'm talking about what you know, these classifications, and just to accept that beauty and that magic. It, it was just that this is what your papers brought to me. And I know it's not a question, but <laughs> 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 just sharing that. Okay, William, you had a question? Yes, 
Thank you. <laughs> we're, pass we're passing the mantle here. <laughs> earlier paper that I um, thought was important. And uh, there, Diana mentioned that uh, the cape and the turquoise shield uh, of uh, Paynell were not colored in. And there is a precedent for um, withholding something from the image, it's something that keeps it from becoming a finished image. And that's in the bundles of objects that are put into the chest cavities of so many figures, uh, as Molly pointed out, the standard bearers or since uh, on that are that were interred uh, with the Temple of Mayor. Uh, the thing that was contained inside those chest bundles, if we want to call them that, is turquoise and jade and copal. As Elizabeth brought up, that's, the also, that's also another animating force, is the aroma. So it's very significant that the same color that is missing from Peinam is the same thing that is missing until it's implanted in the chest of uh, these figures. And I think that this, yeah. I, I didn't see that until Molly's paper in, uh, I don't know if it's valid, but um, it's something that, that um, came out to me. Uh, Ricardo? Uh, yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, somebody, can you give him the torch? Uh, I, I, I love this conference. There were some uh, all, all the great presentations. And I was just wondering, the conceptual tool of the bundle, if we can look at flowery speech as the opening up of a bundle with a powerful influence, and maybe look at the Nahuatl world as bundles within bundles. Also, the maybe the Altepet with the different parts of the Shilakari. Again, it's your or, uh, bundle is what to organize things. And the flowery speech is within the person, and it unfolds, and it influences in a positive, well, more like, like uh, Louis Burkhardt said, in a chaotic or in an ordered way, maybe, or maybe in a good or bad way. And I wonder what the presenters think about this conceptual model for the novel world. As I hope, to whom are you addressing I that? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> anybody? Molly? Uh, I don't want to overstate the case of the bundle. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think it's one organizing principle among many, and I think Barbara's right to point to Ibili and the other form uh, quantifiers, and I think there's more to be done, but I, I think that the bundle is important, and we, can, we see layering everywhere and enclosing. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know about the, the whole of everything being a bundle. Uh, yes, you had your hand up. Questions. Uh, the first one is for Bien Olivier. Was it just coincidental that you ended your presentation with Tinta Negra and Roja? Yes. <laughs> Was it coincidental, right? Yeah. <laughs> Nevertheless, quite significant. And, uh, and the other one was uh, is for our first speaker, for Lisa, right? Mm -hmm. um, in all of this, uh, all of these references to Flores, for uh, rhetoric, and all, I haven't heard. Nothing about Florican, nothing about Florican, nothing about Florican. I'm just curious. Well, um, I think that's probably the result of the time limit, which I regret that I, I went over already. <laughs> but I mean, certainly, uh, that's another great example of the power of speech and the, and the metaphor around speech and flowers that I think is very rich for analysis and could be brought into a, a larger project. But can I ask you something? Is there a literature um, of uh, Nawa love speeches? I mean, do we have them? Well, you mean like, is there well, a court? Well, they keep talking about, mm -hmm. you know, sh you, the, these, these people are seducing uh -huh. the, the opposite sex yeah. with words. Well, uh, not, not exactly, but actually, this is really interesting. Um, I, 
I've sort of been involved in two twin projects. One is working very closely with native language sources like the Florentine Codex, but, but also um, the archival record. And it's remarkable how many um, domestic disputes revolve around a woman talking to a man that is not her husband. And so sometimes it's literally, you know, a, a woman will be stabbed or something like that, um, very tragically, because her husband finds her speaking to another man. And, and there's, there's never any talk about it being more than that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not really clear if, if that's a code in the, in the you know, kind of way that Nawaz talk about these, um, these issues. But, um, but interestingly, in the criminal records, there's definitely you know, a lot of statements by people who, who either deny that they're committing adultery by saying, I've never spoken to this person before, or um, that accuse someone of committing adultery because they saw them speaking to one another. Well, I know that love magic was increasingly of interest to a lot of people in the 16th century, but it seems to involve um, uh, charms and incantations, mm -hmm. potions that people are supposedly slipping into somebody's drink. Um, it just seems that if speech was that important that somebody would have recorded an example of what they thought was seductive speech. Well, right. I think there's a bit in Ruiz de Alacón. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's but, true. Right? Yeah. yeah. But, um, but also because I think, you know, in terms of um, the Inquisition, not in, indigenous people not being part of the Inquisition's jurisdiction, we probably have a lot more about love magic for Spaniards and the mixed race population mm -hmm. than we do for, for Nawaz. Do you want to add to that, Liam? Actually, last year I gave a, I, 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 I gave a conference on Tanda Sot, it's called mm -hmm. Shibuya, and I love incantations in our world. And I, it's still not published, but uh, the paper is. The contemporary? No. Oh. Uh, I was based on three sources. One is in Wisdom the other one is a very important example of a Shibuya charm in the Colise Carolino. And then there is, uh, I found uh, uh, inquisitorial uh, information in the Newberry Library where I was working about another case. And those are the, the three main cases. And then we have, of course, uh, uh, songs that, that, that were sung uh, in, in honor of Pitchin Tecutepli and Sochi Quetzal, and, and we have more information about how those Yeah. I don't know how how long do you want to stay here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Ian, I have a question for you. Um, you made a statement, and I wonder if you elaborate on it, and I think I heard you correctly. Um, that once the gods were anthropomorphized, they seemed to be stripped of their supernatural powers or drained of their supernatural powers. Would you elaborate on that? No. Yes, uh, uh, I was surprised because in, in the Florentine Codex, I, I don't remember uh, one sole representation of a statue, for example. You know, um, when there is a scene of uh, veneration, so the deities are represented just like men, like, um, you know, like Lady Nishita, but not like statues. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I'm not sure that this is a strategy of the informants or, or the strategy of Sagun. I don't really know, but it's it's something that surprised me. So do you think it was also part of the avoidance of paganism and Maybe. idolatry? Maybe. I'm not sure. You know, so sometimes it's very difficult to, to know if this is Sagun project if this is uh, the informant project, or this is the same one, or because you know the informants, there are Christians as well. Yeah. You know, so that's the reason. For example, in the Nava text, you have this uh, qualifier of Diablos Diablosme, or Diablo, and I think they they really think this. It's not uh, only a, a strategy. 
these people, so now we can promise that I feel they are truly Christians. You know? Well, at, at that time, obviously. And this Eloise. is important to remember. I'm going to take a um, question from Eloise, and um, maybe this should not be the last question. <laughs> I see my hands going up. Okay. The photo that I showed, the slide that I showed with the two pictures of Chachi um, Lipa, there were two. One was like a whole figure, mm -hmm. and one was um, Abu Nishikla being sacrificed. The first one is an image. And if you can't really tell from the illustration, but if you read the description, it talks about the making of an image <coughs> in wood of her. So I was very surprised myself that there were two different kinds of representations, one of an image and one of a sheep that being sacrificed. So there you have it. And the two, there were only two illustrations for her, but they covered two different things. Are we good? Oh, oh we're not. Oh, I'm sorry. It's useless. Absolutely useless. You hold it real close to your mouth. This is more common than More uncommon than a question. Uh, last week there was another conference at um, Caltech University, and somebody was talking about it was more focused on the Maya than, than Central Mexico, of course, but it got me thinking because they were just talking about a very, very famous vase, which is the vase of the seven gods, and it's very, very uh, prominently presided over by a bundle, talking about bundles. And uh, there are several gods there, seven gods as a as they are. And the name of the base suggests. And uh, even though a lot of those gods have been given names by the Maya, some of them have nicknames by researchers, there is no mention whatsoever of the names of the gods. They're just, there's just uh, the word Ku, which I would imagine would be more or less the, the equivalent of Tel that's being discussed here. And this is for how a Kunku, which of course is creation date for the Maya. And this is uh, the way I'm interpreting interpreting it right now, it's like the opening of the bundle for ordering things, for putting all this coat or tail in the proper place, so putting it, you know, in mountains and in all the places that need coat or tail. And uh, this is uh, exactly the same idea that it's not gods that we're talking about, but rather like forces or things that are not necessarily divinities, but rather awesome things or things that we are, are, are amazing. And I think this is very nice uh, correspondence between what's being learned here uh, about Central Mexico and what's going on in other cultural areas as well. Um, I, I still think, uh, I'm going back to what Jeanette said, that there's a difference between emphasizing wrapping, which is a structural principle. You can picture it in your mind. It's physical and bundles of associations, which uh, I think she used the word category. And that I think that you have to find a way, what united those three talks for me was that all of them are dealing with that problem of the, the intersection of the visible and the invisible world or the material and the metaphysical worlds and how you get at that through texts like Sagun's, which is so, hard to work with, right? And, I mean, the more work people do, the more you realize you cannot take anything at face value. You have to really scrutinize what you're reading there and what you're seeing in those pictures. Um, and, I, and so the bundle idea, I think, in some I know you both love bundles, but it, it's, it's more this concept of enwrapping and containing things. And if you think about it, you get that in the Andes. You get that in Native North America. It's it's not just limited to Central Mexico. It's uh, probably not even limited to the Western Hemisphere, to be a lot honest. But I'm thinking of temples that get truncated, and somebody builds another temple on top of it. Are they all thinking about bundles? We have the words for what she's talking about, but in the Andes, 
Do we have a word for bundle that seems to refer to architectural construction, for example? Any, any? Uh, see, I kind of think that a lot of this is structural, and it's built into mindsets. People think in terms of organizing principles, which is actually Molly's term. That's what she uses in that paper. And, and it goes back to Levi Strauss, for goodness sake, right? Um, we don't quote him anymore, but he, he, he had insights. Um, and you can support him. Anybody that knows anything about any of these cultures knows that he, he, he was onto something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. information we have on bundles actually comes from the Dakota Sioux. Um, it's North American Indian. And I think in some ways it inspired Mesoamericanists to, to start looking at those bundles in the first place. They're everywhere if you look for them. Um, but, but in terms of being able to talk to people today about what a bundle means, we did better in, in the 19th century interviewing uh, North Americans. Well, <laughs> <Are> you... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Molly. <laughs>